Hey, Jonathan here at Colfax Math. Today I'm going to go over the SIF test for the Army. It is a select instrument flight test. Um, I, I'm, I don't know too much about helicopters and planes, but I was just going to go through this 20 problem test that you can find online at militaryflightstest.com. And you'll see that with a good understanding of math, you're able to work your way through kind of any standardized test. Measure the height. Laminated overnight on a CNC cut jig. Okay, let's get started on this SIFT practice test. Again, this is from militaryflighttest.com. Um, it is a select instrument flight test. This is just to give you an idea of what might be on there. A student of mine asked me about it. Um, he took it on Friday. He said luckily he took four years of high school math, so he knew a lot of the trigonometry on there as well. I don't really know very much about helicopters. I'm only doing this test to kind of highlight um, like a standardized test, how if you have good math skills, you kind of work your way through a lot of these things. So the first one, which of the following is not commonly used? Helicopter taxi maneuver? I don't really know, but ground taxi, hover taxi, rotor taxi, air taxi. If I look at all four of those answers, this, this, and this all kind of mean the same thing. But rotor, rotor is a part of the bird, right? This is a place on the ground, this is a little off the ground, and this is high up. But this is actually part of the helicopter itself, so it's kind of a non-similar thing. So the correct answer is rotor taxi. Okay, down to number two. Lift gives a helicopter altitude by overcoming weight, overcoming decreasing thrust, that doesn't make sense. Increasing torque, that doesn't make any sense. Torque is turning power, none of the above. So lift is forward vector, so it's overcoming weight. So overcoming weight is the correct answer. A single main rotor helicopter requires a great amount of cargo capacity, a tail, tail rotor to balance, a nose rotor, I don't think any helicopters have nose rotors, a tail rotor to counter weight. Well, that doesn't make sense. A tail rotor is a vertical spinning. So it's vertically spinning specifically to counter to counterbalance torque. So the correct answer is to counterbalance torque. Right, this would be lift and this would be a lateral motion. Okay, let's go on to the next page. Uh, Bernoulli's principle. Primarily relates to helicopter payload capacity, lift, thrust, or drag. Well, it's it's lift because Bernoulli's principle is this idea of different speeds of air are going to create a high pressure down below and a low pressure up above, and that's actually what gives you lift. So that's Bernoulli's principle. Tandem ro rotor helicopters make use of a main motor and tail motor two rotors, one above the other. I don't know if I've ever seen that. A front and rear rotor spinning in counter directions. A front and rear spinning in the same direction. Since they have to be counter directions because it doesn't have a tail rotor. So that's what prevents it from spinning around, right? Here's a helicopter. Here are the rotors going around. So you know, if these things are spinning, the bird would want to spin the opposite direction. So that's what that tail rotor is for. But if you had two sets of rotors, one going this way and one going this way, they would counter the, the torque force. Um, number six, this is just a straight math problem. The correct order of operations in math is PEMDAS, and that stands for parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. So that's your order of operations. Number seven, 66 out of 200 planes are not operational. How is this expressed as a percentage? Well, that's the same thing as something over 100. Well, how do I get to 100? I divide by two, so I take that and divide it by two to get 33 over 100. That's a fraction over 100 which is also the same as 33%. This next one right here, mode. 
Mode is really a vocabulary question. You need to know these different words and statistics. Mode means the most frequently used number. So the most frequent, I have one, two values of seven, one value of nine, one value of 11, one, two, three values of 13. I have more 13s than anything else. So that's my answer. The median is the middle number and the mean is the average. So if they asked you the median, that would be the middle number, that would be 11, because there are three values below it and three values above it. The mean would be the overall average. I'd add up those seven values and divide by seven. But the mode is the one that happens most frequently. Um, this is also positive negatives. I have a positive times a negative, which is a negative. So that's negative 12, that's the answer. Positive times positive is positive. Positive times a negative is negative. Negative times a positive is negative. Negative times a negative is positive. So if they're the same, it'll work out to be positive. If they're different, it'll work out to be negative. Some of them are, you know, aren't too hard, but maybe you haven't seen them in a while. So the greatest common factor is, um, it's a, it has to be an integer. So you're looking for a number that'll go into the other numbers. And it's also the largest one. So the greatest, you could connect that to the largest. Whole number, two or more numbers can both be divided by. So even if you don't quite remember the GCF, the greatest common factor, you kind of figure that out through a process of elimination. I mean, it says greatest, it's gotta be the largest one. The two main types of friction, um, you know, if you can't think of that, you could also go through these and, and see if you make sense of them. Kinetic actually means motion and static means stationary. So this means motion and motion, that doesn't even make sense, right? motion and diversionary friction. I don't even know what that word means. That doesn't make sense either. But I see on here, I have like a stationary and a movement. And here's stationary and movement friction. So this is the only one that really makes sense, both static and kinetic friction. The law of inertia. Um, a law of inertia is Newton's first law of motion. So Newton's first law of motion is an object in motion stays in motion. So that's what Newton's first law is. It's number 12. Number 13. Right here, what's force equal to you? Um, this is an important one. If you're in a boxing or anything like that, force is equal to mass times acceleration. That's just an equation I know. Um, so the heart, you know, no matter what you do, you could increase force by increasing mass or increasing acceleration. So there's two ways to really increase force. One is to increase the mass of the object or the other is to accelerate the object and that'll increase force. So that's mass times acceleration. Scalars, um, this is a vector problem. A vector has two components, both magnitude and direction. So usually you represent a vector with a lowercase letter and an arrow over it, saying it has both magnitude and direction. If it only has magnitude, that's a reference to a scalar. So a scalar means that there's only magnitude, um, only say a miles per hour without a direction, so without a velocity. Which are not, which of the following are not co common simple machines? A wedge is a mechanical advantage based on that angle. A pulley is also a mechanical advantage. A lever is a mechanical advantage based on the ratio of that to that. And a rotor, a rotor is not a simple machine. There's a, about a million pieces of physics going on with a rotor. So that's just a very dissimilar thing to the other answers there. Okay, moving right along here, number 16. For every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That's one of Newton's laws. The first law, it's not because we, we knew that that was one about inertia. Um, it's certainly one of Newton's laws, so I'm crossing that out. 
And I guess that is something you need to know that it is Newton's third law of motion. So I guess I don't know too much about flying, but I, I do know those physics principles. So that is Newton's third law. And then these last problems I found kind of interesting. I don't know if they're more logic or understanding, you know, um, reading comprehension, like can you follow written directions is maybe the point of these problems. So 17 says, in spite of his blank, Alex finished a race. So in spite of his height, that doesn't make sense. In spite of his sore foot, that does make sense. In spite of his speed, that doesn't, in spite of his dedication, that doesn't make sense. So these are all kind of beneficial things, height, speed, and dedication. So they're all in the same category. A sore foot is a contrary thing, so you could just select that. Although it was blank, they did not feel tired. Well, pleasant has nothing to do with feeling tired. Excited has nothing to do with feeling late at night does. So that makes sense. Superb, superb, pleasant, exciting are all similar things. They're all positives. Late at night is something. So I think this has to do with like negatives and positives. So the answer is late at night. Here we are at the last two. John is an experienced pilot with a long record of service. So I'm not positive which one's right here. Same thing, but I could figure it out just by kind of deductive reasoning. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of good pilots who have not participated in wars. Whether you enjoy flying or not, probably unrelated to whether you're an experienced pilot. He is an aviator. That sounds like the definition of a good pilot. He can fly multiple aircraft types. I think you could probably be a really experienced pilot and only fly a certain type of plane. So I'm going to eliminate that. And in fact, that is the best answer. Um, and then number 20 here, the vast majority of students enjoyed their experience. So vast, there's a reason why it says vast and majority. So majority means more than 50. Vast means way more than 50. So let's take a look here. That doesn't make sense. Slightly more than 50? Well, it's not slightly. Vast means significantly more. So vast means significantly more than 50. So this is my correct answer here. So I don't know if working through this test helped anybody out there. I hope it did. I think, you know, if you have a good math background, understand some science principles, you could work your way through a lot of standardized tests. Because um, really, a lot of the testing is really about um, how logical you are and what a good problem solver you are. So this is Jonathan at Colfax Math. Uh, thank you for watching. I'd love to hear your comments below. I'd love to hear how your SIFT test went in the comments below. If you liked the video, hit like and subscribe. Thank you for watching.